When Deepwater Horizon happened and we had the crisis of that oil spill off the Gulf Coast, I realized I could use a Twitter account as a news channel because I, I was talking to some of the environmental activists who I work with down in New Orleans and they'd been working in Gulf Shores and they just said, everything you see on the news is bullshit. They are not telling the truth about how bad this is. So I got on a plane and flew down there and started tweeting. And then I was like doing satellite video call-ins to news networks and, and doing interviews and talking about what I had seen and that I'd been threatened with arrest by the sheriffs who were trying to tell me I wasn't allowed to document, film, photograph. I realized that there was such an immense power as an activist in social media. This is Start of the Storefront. Today's guest is actress and activist Sophia Bush. When Sophia was growing up, she envisioned herself as a cardiovascular surgeon and had her life mapped out accordingly. That all changed when she performed in a play to complete her arts credit in high school and was bitten hard by the acting bug. From that moment on, she threw everything she had into acting. Her hard work paid off a few years later when she was cast as a lead on the WB show One Tree Hill. The show would air for nine seasons, catapulting Sophia's career to new heights and making her a household name. And for some, that would have been enough. But as you just heard in the opening, she decided to use her platform as a celebrity to fight for causes she believes in and in so doing, rediscovered her love for her college major of journalism. So listen in as we cover everything from when she was just starting out in auditions and competing with the same three actresses for every role, how she initially wanted nothing to do with social media until tabloid culture forced her hand, and how she's passing the time in COVID isolation. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, the legendary actress Sophia Bush is on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me. The first question is, is really selfish, right? So to me, we have a lot of founders on, a lot of people who have started companies. Um, mm -hmm. The one question I've always wondered, because to me, it's like what you're really doing in some ways is you're expressing your art, right? And, and so mm -hmm. the question I always have for, for people in the entertainment world is, at what point did you get the bug? At what point did you know, like, this is what I want to do? I want to be on stage. I want to do theater. What was it? Mm -hmm. what was that first thing like for you? My first thing was a total accident. I, I always joke, I was on a pre-med track. I wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon. I knew exactly how I wanted my life to go. And then I had an arts requirement at school that I kept putting off because in my mind, I had this really good friend that I grew up with who I'm still very close to. And she's a really traditional theater person who does musical theater and loves show tunes. And I didn't grow up like that. And so I was like, no, theater is her thing. I don't, I don't do that. That's, this is not for me. And then I, I did this play to fulfill my arts requirement. And I realized it was this sort of crazy moment. It felt like an earthquake because English had always been my favorite subject. And I realized that my favorite books on stage came to life. And that not just me as a reader, but an entire group of people as an audience could share in this cathartic experience, could share in humor, could share in learning about other people's lives and, and perhaps increase their empathy while watching. And it, it really threw my brain for a loop. And the rest of high school for me was spent doing so much theater. And then I told my parents I wasn't going to go to medical school. I was going to go and What was their reaction? A BFA. Oh, they were just thrilled. No, my, my mom was like, fuck. And my dad's a photographer and she was like, this is all your fault. Like you turned your hobby into your career and now she thinks it's a thing people do. <laughs> so, That's and, so true. And now are you Isn't like, it? it is a thing people That's do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my dad was like, honey, it's going to be fine. She's so smart. She's going to be so bored. Give her a year and she'll be so bored. And the irony was that they weren't wrong. I didn't feel like I was being intellectually stimulated enough in the theater department that I was in. So I transferred into the journalism school and started studying journalism and political science. And I think my parents thought that was gonna bring me back around, but I essentially was just studying other ways to tell stories and kind of maybe double down on my job. Mm -hmm. And then what goes from there? And so you're in theater, you're starting to really enjoy it. And then you kind of have mm -hmm. this earthquake moment. What is the next step there? So if you're you know, in startup, you're like, let me do this product, let me do some, some yeah. testing, let me find out what's out there. What's your next yeah. step at that point? 
Well, my the next step for me was starting to go out and audition and work. And so my parents' rule was that I wasn't allowed to do that before I was 18. And I had to be in college. And so I was studying at USC and going out and just hustling. And especially during pilot season, you know, I was going to class, I was taking a full course load and then going to two, three auditions a day and, you know, driving around LA, just trying to figure out how to make it work and started working, did this cool movie for HBO with Ray Liotta and worked with Ryan Reynolds and worked on the first season of Nip Tuck and I was just working. And then I I booked my first regular job on One Tree Hill and had to pack up my life and move to North Carolina in, I think it was like 15 or 16 days. Wow. Something crazy. How long after moving, or you're from here, but how long after getting into, you know, going to school and and going to auditions, did that happen? What was that time frame? That was three full years. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, three years of being a full-time student and auditioning full-time as well. And it was nuts. And like the number of movies, you know, that it would get to me and one other person, like it would be me and Jessica Biel, me and Lindsay Lohan. Like it was always down to me and someone who was more famous than me at that time. And, And there was something so frustrating about that, but also so encouraging about it. Because I was like, well, okay, if I'm the other person who they think could do this job as well as this very established person, then I'm doing something right. So I just I just kept my head down and kept the auditioning up. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently who talked about how it took her 10 years of full-time hustle to you know be the lead on a TV show. And she was like, yeah, it took me 10 years to be an overnight success. And it's really true. You know, people don't see the years of the work that you have to put in. I think it's the same in the startup world. You know, you launch a successful company and nobody knows that it took you three years of sleeping on the floor of your office and five years at a hack job before that that you hated, you know, to to make it work. They just see this instant, you know, boom. That's what I wanted to ask you. And so were there some things that you thought acting would be or the process would be that once you were doing it, once you were doing all the auditions, booking these these roles, that it was completely different than you originally thought? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I had a, a sort of subconscious assumption because all of us are viewers, right? So you see a perfectly edited show or film, the score is amazing, the music is swelling, you're feeling the feelings, the sound mix is perfect. And it's designed to allow you to feel on every sensory level what you're watching with your eyes. And when you're making a television show or a film, it has to be silent on a set. You can't have an overlapping conversation the way that you would in real life because it screws up sound. So there's this strange delay. There's immense technicality. There's no music that makes you feel things. And it's so repetitive. And then, you know, I'll never forget when we first got out to Wilmington, it was mid-July. It was 100 degrees. It was 95% humidity every day. And we were filming episodes that were going to be airing at the end of September. So we all had to be in sweaters and leather jackets every day. <laughs> and so we're, we're on set. You can't run the AC. Yeah, you can't run the air conditioning because it also screws up the microphone picking up sound. So we were, I mean, just sweating, melting people on our crew were were suffering heat stroke. And I was like, oh, there's this kind of story out there in the world that actors get babied and taken care of. And like, there is nobody here to take care of us. (laughs) (laughs) You're on your own melting. You're like, really, you really got to hustle. And it's you and the crew. And, you know, you're just problem solving all day, every day. It's, It's about problem solving, being efficient being as open as possible emotionally, but you got to do it on a timeline. For me, I really started paying attention to the DPs, the director of photography on every job I do. And I figure out how I can do my creative job in a way that assists them in reducing the amount of shots they have to shoot so that we can go home in 12 or 13 hours instead of 14 or 15 hours. 
Because that's the difference between the guys on my crew having dinner with their kids or not, you know? Absolutely. Did, when you first got on the show, so two questions here. One, we it's funny, in startup, we always think about the technology that was out at that time, right? And so yeah. here you are. One, did you know it was going to be just a complete success based on the cast and maybe some of the writing? No. No. Okay. no. no way. And we didn't know while we were on it. Because what networks huh. like to do is they don't want you to ask for anything and they really don't want you to ask for a raise. So they don't want you to know your show's doing well. So every year they'd say, well, you guys are on the bubble. Like maybe the bubble could burst and maybe you'd get canceled. And in hindsight, we're like, wait a minute, we were a huge hit show and we absolutely all deserved a raise, but we never asked for it because we were scared our show was going to get canceled. Oh, that's that's crazy. And by yeah. the time the show ended, so you had at that point, a tremendous, almost a decade. And so you've seen social media go from zero all mm -hmm. the way through Facebook, all the way through Twitter. And at some point that's got to activate celebrity on a whole nother level. Was it something that, that you leaned into pretty heavily or was it something that you were just like, oh wow, this is a, a whole new world? No, it took me a while. I also, the timeline for us, you know, when our show hit was the heyday of the internet and print kind of gossip world, you know, the Us Weeklies and the and, and like Perez Hilton. And there was a lot of like really horrible bully culture. And you didn't, you didn't have the option to have your own voice. And every time that you kind of wound up on one of those things, it felt really invasive. It felt untrue. It, it felt like it was really lowest common denominator, like icky vibes. And when social media kind of started, I didn't want to be any more open because that stuff was kind of painful and weird and surprising. And, and we all went through it in our own ways, but people would have a narrative they determined about you and then they would just make that the story. And for a very empathetic and sensitive and intellectual kid, that was a weird world for me. And I think... I think it always really got to me because I had studied journalism and I just thought none of this is right. Like you don't do this to people. You don't treat people this way. So when social media kind of began, I, I didn't want any part of it. And I remember thinking that the cool thing about Facebook could be that I could at least have it be private and I could share, you know, photos and life things with friends at home. But there were all these really sort of insidious things happening that none of us knew about yet where you know, quote unquote fans would hack friends' Facebook accounts or, or do these like mirror accounts that looked exactly the same to get access to ours and then take all of our photos and then upload them to these fan sites. So, you know, like I remember there's a photo of me like giving a bath to my then boyfriend's niece, like this little girl who's naked and they were all over these fan websites and it just felt like such an invasion of privacy because I had not obviously shared that publicly. And, and so I, I really just didn't, I was like, I don't think so. Like, this is not for me. And then the thing that turned the tide was knowing that there were people, because I wasn't taking my own place in those spaces, that there were people impersonating me often who didn't spell check. And I was always so frustrated because I thought, this like, <laughs> if you're going to impersonate... Also, if you're going to impersonate the girl who went to journalism school on the internet, at least spell check. It's quite literally the least you can do. <laughs> um, but when Deepwater Horizon happened and, and we had the crisis of that oil spill off the Gulf Coast, I realized I could use a Twitter account as a news channel because I, I was talking to some of the environmental activists who I work with down in New Orleans and they'd been working in Gulf Shores and they just said, everything you see on the news is bullshit. They are not telling the truth about how bad this is. So I got on a plane and flew down there and started tweeting. And then was, I, I was like doing satellite video call-ins to news networks and, and doing interviews and talking about what I had seen and that I'd been threatened with arrest by the sheriffs who were trying to tell me I wasn't allowed to document, film, photograph, which is all illegal. Um, there were private security for the oil company, you know, trying to keep people out of these public spaces to document what was happening. So I realized that there was such an immense power as an activist in social media. So that's what turned it for me. That's what got me on, on the platforms. And, 
you know, the, the cool thing I think has been to learn how to run my platforms as a hybrid of a sort of news channel, a reality check, a positivity spot, and occasionally do the thing I said I would never do when Twitter started and post pictures of food. I was like, who cares about your breakfast? And the irony is I do. I care about everyone's breakfast. (laughs) I want to see that. (laughs) I'm like, what are you eating? How did you make that? But that's a leap of faith. You know, you, you got on a plane to New Orleans after the Deepwater Horizon blew up and, mm-hmm. and all this fake news was, was happening. Did you ever imagine that you would be using your journalism skills like after like all that? Because you studied it in college and mm-hmm. then it had been I don't know how many years before you had actually used that platform and used that foundation that you had built up. Mm-hmm. What was it like to comb through information and and be the the source for so many people? Honestly, I that's what I do every day. It's still what I do every day. I think it was less that I found journalism and more that it found me. I think it was always where I was going. And I think that my entire kind of purpose being a storyteller and doing what I do is that I'm always trying to figure out how to tell the truth. And for me... I don't know how to do one without the other. And I I certainly don't expect everybody to do it the way I do. You know, some people want to be entertainers and have their opinions be anonymous and, or, or invisible. And that's cool. You know, you do you, but for me, I've had the kind of activist journalist sensibility in me since I was a little kid. And I realized that loving to tell people's stories is why I love to be an actor but that I, I quite literally could not be an actor and not use my platform this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just couldn't do it. I really love you that. You couldn't do it. We talk to so many founders where it's very similar. It's almost like um, they what they're doing today, whether it be a product they're creating or something they're trying to bring into the market is an expression of their true self. And the mm-hmm. true self gets revealed once they've expressed it. And that mm-hmm. art can take seven years, to your point before, mm-hmm. around the startup thing. And and so it's really beautiful that almost like you're just going, you're coming, you're coming back to your own truth and you're mm. able to share that. And because you've kind of, you were enacting for so long, you appreciate it so much more is my guess, right? It's like you lean in harder and you've sort of fine tuned your craft on that too. Yeah. And I, and I think for me, I realized that my expression of what I love to do is, is a hybrid of both of those things, you know, and I've been able to continue to do both throughout my career and I'm pretty excited about it yeah no I love it I'm a huge fan of Jessica Yellen how did you get connected with her and (laughs) she's amazing she's truly just the greatest um Jessica and I honestly we just connected online because of activism and journalism and we've really created this amazing overlapping friend group here in LA and she's just so brilliant and her ability to serve us the news, not noise, as she as she calls it, is so helpful and I think illuminating and helps people make sense of what's going on out there. And to be at the upper echelon of the White House press corps and then to say there's got to be a better way for us to do this for the people, I just think is heroic and amazing. And, and yeah, she's she's such a light. Yeah, absolutely. Um, To borrow a phrase from your own podcast, where do you see yourself going and what kinds of projects do you see yourself working Mm -hmm. on? Uh, Well, you know, with all of the the kind of side effects of COVID happening right now, it's hard to know. I was four days away from starting to shoot my new show up in Toronto, which full circle moment, I'm playing a cardiothoracic surgeon on. So I spent all this prep time before I went to Canada scrubbing into open heart surgeries and shadowing incredible cardiothoracic doctors, cardiac fellows. Oh, my parents were like, of course, of course you are. This is great. So I, I was living my best life getting ready for this. And then obviously it's not safe for people to be on a set right now. So we have to wait. And honestly, the the job is so good. It's so special that I'm perfectly happy to wait for it. And it's the opportunity to be still, you know, at first, I think a lot of us felt kind of tortured by 
being locked up at home. And, and what I've figured out in the last couple of weeks is it, it's up to me how I look at this. And if I take it from the perspective of this is an opportunity for me to be at home and to rest and to take care of my body in ways I never do because I'm always on the run, I can really be ready for this show. So I can sit and watch incredible medical shows and documentaries. I can comb through YouTube and learn how to do a running whip stitch. And I can, uh, I can really just get nerdy and get prepped and, and also do things like this. I'm, I'm doing podcasts from my home office, which is exceptional because there's people who, you know, we've been trying to schedule interviews with for six months and between my schedule and their schedule, it's been so hard and now it's easy. I'm cooking a lot. I'm hanging with the dog and there's been some lightness now that I've started looking for it. And so I'm trying to use all of it as fuel in the tank for when I go up there and, and we're at work 16 hours a day again. Yeah. And you're such a hard worker. You know, it must be hard for you to kind of slow down a little bit. It's really weird. It's for the first two weeks, I kept saying to my best friend, I was like, I feel like I have ants crawling in my veins. I don't know how to do this. I was so anxious and then I, again, I, I, I decided to address the perspective and think about how this could be illuminating. And now it feels different. And now I'm really kind of into it. And, and for the last week, every day I wake up before my alarm goes off, which kind of feels like a sign of being rested and happy and, you know, things like that I'm noticing. And I'm like, okay, all right, we're, we're doing okay here. What's the communication been like between the producers of the show and the network because you know I deadline came out with an article yesterday about the future of the industry going forward post covid how mm. everything from the snacks at the craft service table all the way to crowd scenes where you have a lot of extras all theoretically up in the air at this point because we don't know how slow productions will be to react rolling forward and i was curious mm. if you had heard anything from the producers or networks about how they plan to handle it when eventually they do get the production back up and running. We really don't know yet. Yeah. It's not lost on me that, you know, I'm, I'm getting to work with some of the most incredible medical doctors on, on this new job. And I talk to a lot of doctors and a lot of scientists and a friend who's an epidemiologist very regularly. And nobody knows. It's, it's a guessing game at this point, you know, Never in our lifetime or the history of this industry have we lived in a pandemic with a contagion that works like this one does. You know, just this week, research came out about how they're beginning to suspect that in addition to affecting the lungs, COVID potentially affects the brain. When are we going to have answers on that? When are we going to know if that's true? You know, it's it's all new territory. And as much as I'm dying to go back to work because I'm so in love with this job. I'm also cognizant that this is a real global shift and that taking care of the health of large groups of people has to be the priority here. And so I don't know. I, I, I know that for us, the network ordered a second script from our writers, which feels great. You know, we're all wondering, are they going to Rather than shoot a bunch of pilots, are they going to maybe pick their four favorite shows and order them straight to series for eight episodes and see how they go? I mean, we literally don't know. Right. And we don't know when we can go back and, and we just don't know anything. And so the, it, it requires a lot of surrender and, and also a lot of kind of checking in with ourselves. And, and the thing I keep coming back to is... I just have this feeling. I'm like, now I, I have so much faith in this. I have faith in this group of people. I believe in what we're doing. I've worked on so many sets. I know when there's lightning in a bottle and when there isn't. And this feels like it could be lightning in a bottle. So I'm trying to hold that energetic line for my cast and my crew and and then also just kind of put my hands up and go, I, I have to surrender to this. I don't, I don't know. Is there anything? So during this time, like I've been, I've been doing a bunch of, I, I signed up for master class as an example. I've been making mm. cocktail shrubs while I've been at home. 
Uh, I tried to learn Italian for a little while using just different apps. <laughs> is there any, your hair. Yeah, Natalia has cornrows in my hair right now, which is, you can barely see them, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> is there anything that you're leaning into that's particularly new that, you, that you've never done and maybe things that you've always wanted to do? I was really trying to do that for a while. I did the same thing. I signed up for masterclass. I signed up for this course at Yale. I told myself I was going to get my French back. I, I found this guy who can teach me the piano on Zoom and it was a whole... And I was making myself crazy. I was really making myself crazy. And so I told myself I was going to stop and that I was going to focus on three things, which are move my body every day for at least 30 minutes, make my celery juice and my vitamins, and drink a whole jar of lemon water every morning and try to start powering through these books that have been in a stack next to my bed forever. I was like, I got to reduce. And so now I'm, I'm starting to feel like I'm getting in a little bit of a habit of those things. And now I'm like, okay, maybe I'll add in the Yale course next. And then I'll just sit with that. And then maybe in two weeks, I'll try to see if I can start scheduling these piano lessons because that feels fun. And I'll just sit with that. I realized that the, the kind of obsession with productivity was just another monkey on my back that was making me feel like I was doing this wrong. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said, you're not doing it wrong. It's a pandemic. None of us know. Maybe just being alive and surviving the stress of this for a little while is enough. And I thought, yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay. And so my my friend who I'm co-quarantined with is a photographer and We've been doing these photo projects and I've been helping her on a project she's working on and little things, you know, I've been doing podcasts every day, just stacking them up. And, and so as much as I do this thing where I go, I'm not really doing a lot. When I write out the list of what I've done, I realize it is a lot and I can add to it very slowly. And, and that's, that's okay. I think the, I think the pressure we're all putting on ourselves to use this time maybe isn't the point. I think we've all been running way too fast and we can't keep up with ourselves and the planet can't keep up with us. And, and maybe the lesson in this is to figure out how to reduce, you know, reduce our expectations for ourselves that are unhealthy, reduce our impact on the planet, reduce our speed. Yeah, I love what you touch on in your, your last episode of Work in Progress. Um, when you say there's no right way to feel, there's no mm. right way to to be right now. And we're all just trying to be um, and Thanks. do what feels good to, for us. So I love Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. You know, one, one step at a time. Mm-hmm. Anything you're watching on Netflix? Anything that you're streaming? Mm. I'm watching Blue Planet and I cry at the end of every episode because I see what we as these idiot humans are doing to the to the earth and i keep just thinking about how this could be our opportunity to be different on the other side so i really hope that it is because if we kill the oceans then we all die um super uplifting i know uh (laughs) but it, it it feels so important to plug into what else have i been watching what's in my list right now I went and watched Parasite again. My God, that movie is so good. Amazing. I am, I'm about to start Orthodox, which I've heard is incredible. Oh, it's very good. It's very, movie. very good. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. I watched Black Panther again because that movie makes me feel hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm also open to recommendations. Oh, somebody was telling me, is it an HBO show that Rick Rubin's Shangri-La is apparently so amazing? It's an amazing show and it opens up. So for me, at least I'll speak personally, it just opened up my world to so many artists that I would have mm. not necessarily found or would have never showed up in the playlist because of the algorithm that mm. just blew me away. And his process is, it's similar. It's like, it's, it's about being present and it's about not letting time interfere with that presence and letting it breathe, letting the art, the music, the feel, He's whatever so it is, just letting it breathe mm. and then trying new things within that space. And so that's so cool. It's a great show. And I've, it's funny. I mean, for me personally, it connected where he has a Spanish artist that comes on the show 
And everything she sings, all the songs. So because I was born in Peru, I grew up listening to what we would call like Latin classics. And mm. she sings all of those. And I just connected with it. And I, I've been playing the songs nonstop. And so because of COVID, we're at home. And so I, I was making ceviche the other day and I'm FaceTiming my mom and I have the music on in the background. She's like, oh, she's like, do you know, you know that song? You know that song really well. She's like, you grew up on that. And I was like, that's, there's a reason I'm connecting with it. And I didn't yeah. know. And then she was just like singing the songs while I'm making ceviche. And it was just like that, that moment, right? Where it was like, it that's all made so sense. cool. And it, and it was everything. It's like, what's the first step when you, when you, when you cook Peruvian food, you put on music. Yep. So that's step one, <laughs> right? And then you make yourself a nice little cocktail. So we make Pisco Sour. And then it was like yeah. smoking with my Ugh. mom. And then I love a Pisco all. Sour. When we're allowed out of our houses, I'm coming over. I'm like, you're making ceviche and Pisco's, let's go. So good. <laughs> yeah, the cocktail game here has been, uh, we've been upping the ante. We had Lynette on from Masterclass on the podcast. And so we got to, we got to, you know, she's that's been like a mentor now. That's why you've been making shrubs. Yeah, we've yeah. Been, like, just been like, because it's a great way to just reuse fruit that's about to yeah. expire. And then you can yeah. just, yeah. You Last night vinegar, we, have, we did a podcast sugar. with our friend who's a, a mixologist up in San Francisco. And he looked at our bar and had us make something with what we had. And we had this grapefruit shrub, shrub that you had made. Yeah. And it was amazing. I need to, I need to get in on that. I need to learn about the shrubs. It's great. It's really cool. It's basically just take any fruit that you have left, put it in a, in a jar, add one cup of vinegar and one cup Apple of sugar, vinegar. and then just let it shake it, let it sit for a couple days, two, three days, and then, wow. and that's it, strain it, and then put it in the fridge, and it lasts um, about three months. It keeps for three months. Whoa. And, and all you, you have do to do is add tonic it. water to it. So you just take one ounce of that, you add a little tonic, and then maybe a splash of your favorite spirit, and... Um, it's really amazing because you, you smell vinegar, but you don't taste it yeah. at all. Interesting. You taste the fruit. It's really interesting. It's almost like a kombucha. Like you can think about it in that cousin. It's like a cousin. Okay. That. that I will add to my sooner than later quarantine to-do list. This feels really productive and excellent. And it feels like I'm also just connecting with something, right? It's like I'm connecting with the fruit. I'm reusing it. I'm not throwing it away. Yeah. Like we're just using the earth in different ways, but I'm still able to use it for a, a cocktail. It's like the high and the low, the balance of the whole thing. One of the things I've actually started doing, and Natalia, we've talked so much about this, but I finally am getting all my compost going. And I have this huge, not huge, I mean, it's like a rectangular Tupperware container now that I keep on one side of my sink. And every time I fill it up, I bring it out and... I don't know, there's been something magical feels like it's happening in the backyard with the garden. And I talked for so many years about wanting to get bees. And then like a year, maybe a year, year and a half ago, the bees just showed up and they started building this massive hive in my wood pile. And I was like, oh shit, okay, wow, they were listening. So, you know, again, one of the things I had the opportunity to do being home is... I had this incredible organization come out here and rescue my beehive with me. And so we got them into a proper hive and now they have a little home and, and we're working on moving it over to where it's going to actually properly be. And yeah, it's like, I don't know, there's something about reducing waste again, you know, reusing this stuff, composting, making these shrubs helping the bees, you know, planting lavender for them. Like, I don't know. It all feels kind of amazing. Okay. So here's something that I've been doing. So one cup of water, half mm. cup of honey, and yeah. then just put lavender or sage, whatever you have in there, mm -hmm. let it boil, stir it. And then I use, so basically that's like a, it's almost like a simple syrup, but it's all natural. And then I put yeah. like one ounce of that in my almond milk latte and it just tastes Ooh. Fantastic. But you can also use it in cocktails. That's just another one. We used it in a cocktail the other day. Yeah. Oh, guys, we should just do a Zoom dinner and make things. Yeah. We'll start with we like, a cocktail hour. We've been yeah. doing a lot of wine tasting. So we had, oh, friends. yeah. We set up a Pinot Noir tasting. Where we did like over France two days. versus uh, America. France versus yeah. California, Oregon. Wait, I've done that the last two Friday nights with some friends that are on the West Side. We've been doing combinations. So it'll be a, we did a white an old world white from France and then a white from California. And then we did the same thing, old world red, red from California. And it's been really cool to learn about the regions and, you know, and the to find wines you normally might not have found yeah, otherwise. I mean, yeah. 
we're doing a beer one tomorrow. So the brewery that we're trying to launch that it was going to city hall and everything was looking good until this happened. And so it, it got stuck because city hall shut down. So they're kind of down. They're like, what do we do with this time? You know, we don't have anything to do in terms of the brewer. So I was like, Oh, let's just, let's just schedule like zoom brewing tastings and you can explain yes, their beer. Try all their beers. Cause their beer is so different. It's like nothing I've ever had. It's really this one with basil infusion, which is amazing. Just so amazing. Prickly pear. Oh my God. So we set it all up. Same thing. It's the same wine crew. And so Sign me up. I'm in. It's you know, delicious. It and we have to send you the beer too. Okay. I, okay. They're making, <laughs> yeah, they're making the, uh, the deliveries today. Usually we do it. So most of the friend group are doctors. And so it's also, there's a safety in that for me where, <laughs> where, <laughs> yeah. where, where I get to ask them questions about what is going on? What are you right. hearing? You know, they're at the front lines of it. Yeah. And, and after, so, after like the tasting is halfway through, they tell us what's going on. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a wow. superintendent on who's saying, you know, nothing will reopen until August. And so like she was on the call with governors. And so it's like, yeah, crazy, but it's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's so fun. And I, and I love being uh, a little tipsy and then realizing, <laughs> oh, I'm at home still. This yeah. is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to get an Uber. Yeah. You don't have to put shoes on. It's really nice. Honestly, All the creature yeah. comforts at your disposal, right? At your fingertips. <laughs> I have indoor shoes now and I love it. Yeah. I just have these, you know, floppy slippers that I live in and it's great. Yeah. It feels very Japanese, very Zen. Yeah. You know, I have one yeah. thing to ask, Sophia. You know, you mentioned composting, you mentioned the beehive, and we were talking about things that we've watched on streaming services. Uh, it reminded me of the documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. Are you familiar with that? That's in my queue also. So I, one of the things I did last week finally was I sat on Netflix and I did the My List because I realized I have these lists of things I know I want to watch. And then every time I sit down in front of the TV, I can't think of a single thing that anyone's ever made. And there's 8,000 channels and, you know, tens of thousands of things. So I, I went through and I made a list and that's in there. Everyone has told me how good it is and I can't wait to see it. They're not lying. Cool. Yeah, I, I can't recommend it enough. Sophia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been yeah. super fun. Do you want to just Thanks, tell our guys. listeners, obviously, where they can listen to your podcast, the name of your podcast? Sure. Yeah. My podcast is called Work in Progress and it is everywhere you find podcasts on Apple, on Spotify, on Google Play. And it's a really cool place to get a little nerdy and have a little fun and, you know, learn something. And I just love it. I honestly, one of the things, because I've really been trying to think every day about what I'm grateful for during this. I am so grateful for video capabilities. Can you imagine if our parents, when our parents were our age, if this had happened and you couldn't video conference with anyone, you couldn't see other people? It's a hard, hard pass for me. I, I talk yeah. to my parents, I think more now than I did before this whole thing happened. Yeah. You know, I, like every other day, like, what are you guys doing? You want to just sit and hang out? <laughs> yeah, it's totally. Great. The interpersonal connections that have come out of this are the true silver lining of being isolated and quarantined. Yeah, truly. Well, thank you so well, thanks, much. Thanks, guys. So yeah, fun. We'll thank you very soon. much. Talk to you soon. Right. Great to see y'all. The Startup the Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Megan Conrad, Haley Nelson, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. They just released a new song on their SoundCloud that I highly recommend checking out. We've got more great episodes coming up in the near future, so if you aren't already, consider subscribing. This is a very supportive and helpful community of entrepreneurs, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. We'd also love to hear how you all are coping with this epidemic, so reach out to us on all the social media platforms at Startup the Storefront. And you can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes, available wherever you get your podcasts and on our website, startuptostorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.